welcome back from the break, everybody. I hope you all filled your boots with cake. Um, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce the final session of the day. Um, the Value of Creativity Group has long been tasked with uh, challenging and developing best practice in evaluation. Uh, and this feels uh, particularly relevant when it comes to social media. Um, which has just exploded on us, I guess, uh, over the last few years without any ind industry standard metrics to guide, to guide us. Uh, and I think kind of by common consensus uh, has uh, been a bit of a bugger to measure. Um, but we hope that that now has changed uh, thanks to the work uh, that uh, uh, this group of people uh, have been doing. So I'm now delighted to hand you over to Stephen Mayer, um, who's the Marketing Society Chairman and Founder and CEO of uh, uh, MBA, uh, and he's going to explain uh, what everyone has been up to. So, Stephen, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, following Mark Earls is never a good thing to do, unfortunately, but sadly that's the way things <coughs> go sometimes. So we'll do our best at this slot in the day to uh, liven things up a little bit. Um, and... Uh, I think we know that, you know, Rihanna's obsessed with it, Lady Gaga's obsessed with it, a quarter of the, a quarter of the world's population is obsessed with it, and uh, we know that it's growing 20% year on year. You know, social is absolutely at the heart of everything about the future of communications, and uh, in many ways, um, the, the odd thing about it is that despite that, a lot of the rigour and a lot of the way that we approach communications and marketing in lots of other ways and, and the kind of brains that are applied if you like to the more traditional forms of communications are not necessarily quite applied in the same way to the world of social. Now of course it's a new phenomenon we understand that and it's very much something where not surprisingly the legacy of information is not quite with us so that that's that's kind of reasonable but at the same time we know we very much we think there's an opportunity here for the, for this future reality if you like to to be to be presented in such a way where the rigor and the and the performance measures are applied as much to social as they are applied to tv and other forms of communications now despite the fact this is all about the future i mean this did actually start in a kind of slightly old world kind of way with a, a lunch with Nigel Gwillem, head of digital at, um, at the IPA, and Paul Baines, fair director general, who, as you know, probably likes a lunch in the Woolsey. So basically, we had a lunch in the Woolsey, and uh, we started talking about this issue and about the fact that there's a lot of frustration amongst, I think, a lot of clients and agencies that they didn't necessarily have the metrics, their framework, and the rigor, um, and they didn't exactly know how much to spend on social, how much it effect was going to be, and, and it, it needed that kind of rigor applied to it. Now, of course, the VC, VCG also has done some, some fantastic work in this area. And James Devon, my planning director, has been very involved with the rest of the team in terms of making sure that the, that, that the effectiveness rigor is applied to areas like social as well. So those two things kind of came together, really. And so the IPA Social Works, it started out being called a steering group for IPA social media measurement, which, you know, let's be honest, is not fantastic. But eventually we got to IPA Social Works, which is a sort of marginally better name, really. So, so what we did is we created, um, I expect, recognizing the fact that social is an ecosystem, we made, we made sure that we created the kind of steering group and the ecosystem that was important. So importantly, uh, partly through the role that I perform in the Marketing Society, we linked up with the Marketing Society. Clearly, it's very important to have clients absolutely at the center of this organization, so it's not just an agency forum. So we added, and I'll talk a little bit about who those people were in a minute, out of the client side of things. Then, of course, what we, what we did is the social media platforms themselves. Twitter came, came and got involved very early on, we're very pleased to say, and have been a major supporter. Facebook and LinkedIn have then come along as well. Uh, Mark Earls, uh, Paddy Barwise from the London Business School, various other thought leaders got involved with us. And then the MRS uh, basically uh, got involved as well. So we've ended up with this consortium of people, if you like, who all who've all got an interest in this area and are all equally, equally keen to make sure that there are some more standardized metrics, if you like, applying to social media and make sure that the rigor that applies, if you like, the thousand of wonderful effectiveness case studies that exist at the IP and the data bank is as much applied, that rigor is applied to social, as it is applied to, to television and other forms of communication. So that's how, kind of how it came about. So um, basically... Um, there are three parts, really, to what we're trying to uh, or aiming for here. And what, what, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to briefly talk a little bit about uh, the, the process we've been through and the methodology we've been through to get to some of the cases that we're going to talk about. And then what I'm going to do is introduce um, 
uh, various, various uh, authors of the cases that are very specific, that, if you like, bring to life some of the methodologies that, that uh, we, we've, we've unearthed. There are three parts to it, really. One, one is all about um, adding to the treasure house of learning. So we know that the IP effectiveness case study bank is absolutely phenomenal. What we want to do is take that same kind of principle of case law, if you like, and apply it to social. So arrive at a series of cases and best examples we can. Secondly, what we want to do is come out with very robust methodologies. So as much as we possibly can, recognising there is no absolute science in anything. We want to arrive at methodologies that the general view is that they apply to the way that social media is invested in and the way that it works. And then thirdly, uh, we're looking at a detailed guide of the various research techniques that are used to actually evaluate that, that, uh, social, those social media campaigns. So they're the three things that basically we're trying to come out. Now, as I said, it's been a very much a collaborative approach. Um, there's the Value of Creativity Group, there's the Marketing Society, MRS, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. And that is really important that, that we absolutely cover all the different areas and all the different stakeholders involved in this. The group, I'm not going to go through everyone in this group, but it's been a very, very large group. We've been meeting for pretty much the last nine to ten months now on a monthly basis sharing a lot of this data, sharing all this information, developing hypotheses, developing our thinking. You know, as you'd expect, because this is in a sense a social experiment, we've been operating a little bit like a social experiment as a group. We've been making sure that what we've been doing as a group of people is, is iterating together this whole approach and working out what the methodologies, the hypotheses are going to be, and, and deciding whether something's of value or isn't of value. And that's, that's been a wonderful group of people, and I'm very, very, very proud of everyone who's put the time in, and I really thank everyone for all the time they've put in for that. So what we did is three things. First of all, uh, we developed some hypotheses. Secondly, we did a lot of desk research and outreach. Um, you know, we've looked at around 40 existing reports, and Frank Casti is going to come up in a minute and <coughs> talk about some of those things. Um, she personally has put a phenomenal amount of work into this, which has been amazing. We've explored me measurement experts like Peter Field. Uh, we've looked at over 100 cases. We've done 20 depth of case interviews. So we've done quite a lot of work uh, over that period of time um, to get to us this, to this stage where we're at today. What we then did is, you know, again, very much using the methodology behind the IPA Effectiveness Awards and, and to ensure, if you like, there's one thing we want to make sure happens here is the rigour that is always coming through in everything the IPA always does in terms of creativity and effectiveness is applied to this. So that part of that rigour, of course, is having a peer review. So yes, we can arrive at case studies that we think are important or, or example of cases that we think are of value, which we think work. But the next thing we want to do is make sure that the peers, if you like, those people who've got expertise in effectiveness. And so a lot of the people on this list are people who've been involved in evaluating effectiveness, effectiveness judges over the years. We want to make sure that those people thought that there was value, that we weren't kidding ourselves, that something actually wasn't a particularly good case when, it, when, it, when, it, when, it, when, when actually it wasn't. So they became like a sanity check, really, to make sure that the cases we ended up with really do resonate and they really do prove the ROI of, of as much as we can or certainly prove methodologies of value that you can get. So that brings us very much to today. And today is, is going to be about three things. And I would stress that you know, this is the launch of our initiative. I mean, we absolutely don't have all the answers here. We, we absolutely don't know everything there is to know, quite, quite, quite the opposite. What we've got, though, is we've got some initial findings, some initial learnings. And we very much see this as the start, start of the process. And one of the things I'm going to talk about at the end is ways in which we would like everyone to get involved. Uh, because clearly what we've done at the moment is through the outreach program, we've talked to lots <coughs> of clients and lots of agencies about great cases they might have. What we want, obviously, is more and more of those so that we can put this bank of data together. We can evaluate and develop the methodologies, develop hypotheses so that we end up with some really, really good findings and data and guides and, 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 and sort of definitive views about the metrics of social and how it works. So what we're going to do is, first of all, Fran's going to take us through some overall observations that have come out amongst our research, if you like, and all the desk research, all the interviews that's taken place over the last few months. Secondly, we're going to very briefly talk about the hypotheses framework that uh, is, is ways in which we think social is tending to be used. Of course, everyone knows there's all sorts of ways. It could be customer service, 
It could be customer insight. It could be communications. There are whole sorts of different ways social is being used. We've got some hypotheses there. And then thirdly, we're going to talk about some example cases. And, you know, I'm really delighted to say that we've got uh, Christian from O2. We've got Joanna from BT. We've got Chris from TFL. Um, as well as Fran talking about case, other case studies that come from, from Iceland and from uh, fridge raiders as well. So we've got some good cases to talk about that really exemplars of our methodology and our sort of thinking. So we'll do that, and then we'll come back at the end and we'll do a panel session, and, and those presenters will come on the stage uh, as well uh, with me. And, um, you know, I've, I've got some, I'm sure we've all got some questions to ask, but, you know, I'd love it if, if everyone, everyone would be very much open to the floor <coughs> and we turn that to an interactive session when we've been through the, the questions. Because, as I say, this is very much a starting point. It's an iterative process. We really want everyone to get involved in it, to offer support, to get to, get to offer cases, brands, customers that they think are relevant so that we can really create this fantastic data bank that ultimately gives us some of the answers, if you like, or some of the methodology, some of the thinking that allows us to all go forward to know, A, how much we should invest in social, B, how we measure it, and feel more confident about those decisions. So I'll now pass over to Fran, who will uh, take us through some of those observations. Thanks, Stephen. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. So I'm going, to go, I'm going to take you through around seven observations before we get to uh, a couple of the case studies. And the first one I wanted to talk about really was the, the need for not only rigour in social media measurement, but commercial rigour. We're at the moment, at the moment we're talking about visibility. People talk about the visibility of social. We want to go from visibility to effectiveness. We want to go from accurate numbers to relevant numbers, relevant numbers for business and for brands. I mean, in some of the cases that we looked at, there weren't even any business objectives outlined at the beginning. And we certainly feel that this, that there will be a hugely renewed focus on, uh, on social, partly because there's an increasing amount of resource and investment going into this area. In my conversations with people over the last past few months, I've had a number of people talking about how they've just announced their first new global head of social, or they've just, in, they just increased their, their, their metrics to at a phenomenal number in their, in their social strategy. So there's a renewed focus into this area. And, and, and essentially, we do believe that it needs to be made accountable like any other marketing channel. Now, some of the most effective uh, cases were where social were actually integrated into the rest of the marketing communications. I'm th particularly thinking of the advertising ones here. But uh, there, are, there were huge benefits to doing that. On the campaign side, um, by embedding social into much longer-term strategies, not only did, m did it mean that social had access to higher budgets, but because those campaigns were over a longer period, it was much, much easier to, uh, to measure. And on the customer, customer services side, as we'll see later on, particularly uh, with BT and, uh, and TFL to a degree, when social was integrated into other data sets, the strengths of social were not only uh, much more clearly visible, but, uh, but it much more easily seen as well. The interesting thing about this social data set is that it th is the tremendous richness that is within it. And, and, and very, very often, the whole of the ecosystem, I mean, we, we sort of put on here, it's, it's, you know, it's an island. It, it is an ecosystem, very often, and it's siloed. And that richness um, uh, should, be, should be really connected to, you know, to the mainland, if you like. And an finally, another reason on this was because in, in a number of businesses, in fact, for a, a great many businesses, social is not a channel choice anymore. It is uh, it's a part of doing business. It's a way of doing business. In fact, um, Adam Voigtman from MasterCard said, you know, I think of social media um, like air. We've got no choice now but to breathe it. Certainly one area that we have started to see more improvements on is the, is the area of test and learn. It's no longer a, a one piece of creativity uh, type of um, activity. It is much more of a te test and learn mentality. And in fact, there are many lessons from direct marketing that can be applied to social uh, where, where we would learn a lot more. And part of that is actually that we need to plan 
what data we need to analyse up front. So there's a lot of gathering of data as we go along and let's see what we, what we find right at the end. But actually, if we take the time and, 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 and take 90% you know, of the time to define the problem that we are trying to solve at the beginning and sort of 10% then trying to solve it, we might get a lot further. There is no doubt that social very often delivers qualitative data at a quantitative scale. It is also unmediated, which means that it should provide much better opportunity for customer truths than many other forms of research. But because of the volume, I think it is very, very likely over the next year, and in fact certain brands are already seeing it, and you, you will see it um, in a moment from, um, from O2, that you know, tools like machine learning will come, into, um, um, come into, into play much, much more um, prevalently to help to analyse the, the, the volume of data that is generated. If you think of something like the X Factor generating 700,000 tweets in an hour, you, know, you need something other than, than qualitative approaches to be able to analyse the benefits of that. It is also further proof that marketeers are going to have to get a lot more data savvy. We've been talking about this for the last year or so, but this, this is another reason that marketers are really, really going to have to get upskill in their data anal uh, the analysis skills that they have. And it's really ironic when you think about it that one of the areas of greatest richness of data is attracting, you know, in some ways, some of the least levels of uh, good measurement. We are still, um, we're still meeting in the cases, some of the cases that we read, um, the issue of causation and correlation, <laughs> uh, particularly in the advertising examples. But you know, just because two data sets, uh, two points of data correlate, they don't necessarily, it doesn't really mean that uh, one causes the other. Now, there are brands uh, who are approaching this very, very sensibly with A-B testing and with... Uh, controls, but it's absolutely not widespread. And actually, if you think about the cases that we looked at, in some ways, they were the tip of the iceberg. You know, they were the ones that were put forward for awards. There's a, f a phenomenal amount of campaigns that you know that that we are not um, that we're not uh, that we're not privy to, where I'm, I'm we're very concerned that that is still the case. Now, related to this, um, is a focus that is still happening, which is a focus uh, on improving loyalty and loyalty strategies. Of course, no, um, no IPA uh, um, uh, uh, conference would be complete without uh, an era in, in, the, in the era accountability chart. And obviously, much work has been done already in this area. Um, but it did demonstrate that mar marketing communication strategies that focus on penetration tend to do better. And certainly, some of the advertising cases that we have uh, that we have and we're going to show, um, uh, did also do that. Um, and the ones that didn't were a lot less convincing. Now, one of the, probably the most uh, important uh, factors that we found out was the potential for social to make organisations much more customer-centric. If you think about the setting policy and tone and process and messages, uh, that process is, by its nature, interdisciplinary, which means that organisations like, uh, or departments like operations, PR, legal, IT, HR, all have to tend to get involved. And uh, when, we see, when we come on to the TFL <coughs> case, this is a very good example of that. So the creation of a customer of a, of a social strategy can enforce a customer centricity that is less hierarchical, more collaborative, and potentially a lot more effective. Now, all of these seven points, we believe, as, as uh, Stephen was saying, are the sort of starting point, really, for better performance and effectiveness um, from, from social activity. Now, he said that we started by looking at a hypothesis framework. Now, what, what was social being used for? You know, how was it being measured? Now, we came up with this, which you don't have to read, fortunately. Um, and when, we, when you really look at this in detail, what we really came to examine was three areas that people were really looking at. One, they were using it for marketing communications, one for customer service, and another for customer insight. 
Now, so far, we found evidence for the commercial impact from social in two of those areas so far, for marketing communications and customer services. Partly, I think, because of the reward and success system that we have in our industry where you know, it is the advertising, it is the communication and service awards that come to the top and less so the insight. So as we move on this project to the next stage to insight, you know, that's where we really want to, uh, want to focus on. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that there's a lot of richness there, but it's just getting, getting into it and getting clients to, uh, to, get, to give us the information that is going to be important. So what I'll now do is go through a couple of the cases. I'll briefly go through um, Iceland and Madison's, and then Chris and Christian and Joanna will go through their own experiences. So the first advertising case we want to look at is uh, Visit Iceland. Now the issue that was prevalent in that country was that not only were they the biggest casualty of the 2008 financial crisis that was causing havoc uh, with their economic system, but also the volcano eruption of the Eyjafjallajökull <laughs> volcano. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Ayafiatla <laughs> Yokutl <laughs> volcano, <laughs> um, which was uh, uh, clearly causing huge, uh, huge issues with the tourism industry. The negative publicity that the country was facing was really massive. And, you know, these were the projections, uh, the dotted line, therefore, showing the potential shortfall across the year, which was about 22% of over the busiest months that they were looking to, uh, that they were thinking that they might lose. So they asked the uh, Brooklyn brothers for help and gave them an objective of just increase this by 10% and we'll be okay. You know, we'll, we, we can manage. And the Brooklyn brothers' response <coughs> was that they turned the traditional tourism model on its head and decided to ask the Icelanders to share their stories rather than try and persuade the tourist, uh, potential tourists to come and visit in the normal way. In short, what they were doing was starting all the stories from within, from within the country. So there were three stages of this that, and then their use of social to inspire Icelanders themselves to actually go and participate and provide them with the social tools needed to go and encourage other people to come. And then after that, reward them for actually doing that. So they created an army of fans across Facebook, Twitter, Vimeo, and actually on the uh, Inspired by Iceland site itself. So much so that after day one, 27% of the nation, 27% of the nation had sent a video from the website to somebody abroad. After six weeks, over 50% of the nation had done that. And I think these are the extraordinary figures. They, f they posted personal stories to try and encourage people to come. This was a nation in crisis. Um, I think we're going to show a video now. So the results were extremely good. Um, it, this was not just a, a UK-wide um, campaign. This, this was across a number of their major markets. And as you can see on that right-hand side there, you know, all of those... Uh, all of those figures went up by a lot more than the 10% that they were asked to do. So with the, the attitudes and behaviours clearly changed. The budget that they used to do this was a, a little over £2 million. And an extra £165 million was delivered to the Icelandic economy as a result of this, with a huge Romney figure that you can see there. Now, how they managed to do this, and how did they manage to measure it, was by footfall through the airport. There's not very many ways of getting to Iceland, so they knew that actual people arriving at the airport obviously had uh, potentially had some effect. Plus, when you combine that with the average spend per person, that's how they got to that sort of figure. I think there are enormous lessons to be learned, not only in the, in the tourism industry, uh, but also for crisis management as a whole, in fact. In fact, I understand that the, uh, the, the New Walk case study uh, there's just one of the Grand Prix, has taken some of the elements of this study, in fact, and, and won another award to that effect. 
So the next example that we want to look at is a completely different market and a completely different uh, campaign. And that is of Madison's Fridge Raiders, a small piece of chicken. It's been done by Saatchi's and Vizian. And the issue here was... Sorry. <laughs> the issue here was that the product was in decline. Um, the research suggested that mums just didn't know when to give them to eat. So they needed to devise a usage, a time that was just their own. So they then did some further research and said, OK, well, when do kids need a snack? And clearly that was one of the times was as soon as they come home from school and they are Hank Marvin, as they've seen by their, their TV campaign from two or three months before. The research also suggested that two-thirds of teenagers actually played computer games after school, and a huge percentage of those ate while they were playing games. The proposition, and of course that was extremely tricky. So the proposition that they created therefore was Fridge Raiders, the snack for gamers. And so they asked then gamers to create the perfect snacking device for eating whilst gaming. And the engagement strategy they used was to, to, uh, to take an existing, credible celebrity in that marketplace called The Syndicate Project, plus his existing audience, and ask him to participate in this, uh, in this, um, in this idea. Interestingly, I think, and, and importantly, actually, the budget for this was around half a million pounds. Now, if you remember what I said at the beginning about the, sh you know, the short-term natures of some of these social campaigns and the small amounts of money that were put behind them, you know, this is an example of when it was done uh, with a, an enough time and enough focus and enough money, it's a much, much easier thing to, to measure. And we're going to see another short video. OK, so um, when they talk about the 65% increase in sales, obviously that is the, the total campaign, including the, the sales promotion that was going on at the time. The tricky thing is then to isolate what the social did. But by talking to the econometric company involved... Oh, sorry. Um, the, uh, the market mix models that they created um, managed to isolate the, sale, the sales effect from social to be 20%, with a return on investment of 2.44 for one. Now, as it turns out, that was the best campaign return on investment they'd ever me measured for that brand. So I think it's a very interesting uh, uh, approach to have the market mix modelling um, when you can do it. So I'm now going to pass on to the three representatives from three more brands to talk about their social experience. We're first going to hear from Chris McLeod from TFL, then Christian from O2, and then Joanne Howard from BT at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Fran. So we're following the meat helmet. This is the train spotter slot now. <laughs> so I'll take questions and queries about your Oyster cards and congestion charge and traffic, you know, and parking tickets you've got. If we could do those at the end of the meeting. That's normally what happens to me. When I, when, I, when, I come to, when I come to these sort of things. Um, thank you to the IPA for um, asking me to, um, to, to come along and uh, talk today. Um, TFL is a profoundly analogue business, so you wouldn't necessarily immediately think of, think of TFL when you, when you sort of hear social being talked about. And we use it in a, in a particular way, which I'm going uh, to outline. Um, it's probably a bit of context. I'm going to primarily talk about our Twitter um, uh, usage, but we use all uh, social media platforms. And I'm primarily going to talk about our, what we've done with, with, uh, with Oyster. A uh, bit of context about TFL and Oyster generally. So TFL has about, 20, about 24 million journeys a day on, on TFL products or uh, things that we control. So we're, we're actually a huge brand in terms of, uh, in terms of touch points. So that's the amount of travel uh, in, in London. There's about 15 million Oyster cards floating around um, out there. And two Fridays ago, there was a world record set <laughs> when 3.6 million individual Oyster cards were used on a single Friday. So different, different cards were used on a, uh, on a single Friday. And that was 71 million 
71 million journeys. So that gives you a sense of the sort of the scale of the uh, of the operation that that that, that we uh, that we deal with. Anyway, I was talking about train spotting. Do, do you know how many train spotters it takes to change a light bulb? No, three. One to change the light bulb. One to write down the number of the light bulb, uh, and one to hold the anoraks. <laughs> so, um, what did we want out of uh, out of social when we when we got it? What were our objectives? Well, well, first of all, there was a there was a human element that we we had an opportunity to sort of humanise our offering. Uh, we knew that it was when and where customers uh, wanted to engage with us. That was the feedback we were getting. It's fast, uh, efficient. Uh, and there's cost-saving potential. We're a, public, we're a public body, you pay for us. We're constantly looking to how we can reduce the cost of servicing uh, uh, our business. There was a customer appetite, particularly, uh, particularly around Oyster, and I'll talk a bit more about that. Fran touched on customer insight and feedback. When we talk about customer insight, we, we often talk about some pretty basic stuff about just how we operate our system. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be high-powered vision about where the customer is going in the next 10 years. It could just be about you know, how the northern lines are running today. Um, it also, however, addresses some corporate objectives for us. Firstly, real-time information. We're very committed to telling people in real time as much as possible about their, about their service. Day, you know, I mean, the ultimate would be that you were always connected, always on, and knew where the transport you wanted to use or was planning to use was. That's a commitment of ours. We want to be easy to do business with. Again, many public bodies have a sort of a slight reputation of being quite hard to deal with, quite hard to, quite hard to access. And we want to be um, uh, easy to, to do business with. We want to be, we're committed to being customer focused. Uh, and we want to demonstrate, you might find this hard to believe, but that TFL cares. Uh, and the, a bit about what we, what we stand for. We've recently unveiled a sort of a, a new corporate positioning, which is what we call Every Journey Matters. And again, the social uh, aspect of, uh, of that was quite an important part of, of, of showing that, 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 that care. However, we use um, social media in a very hard-nosed customer service type, type of way. We don't really talk too much about likes and engagement and sort of that side of, uh, that side of stuff that quite often goes on around social media. We, we use it in some very, very tough and practical ways, which is not to say in, in the way that we do that, it gets a lot of sort of support and people sort of, people like us for doing it, but it's not primarily, we don't do it primarily to be liked. What's the current status? We've got 24 Twitter feeds, two Facebook pages, and um, it's, it's probably nearer 700,000 followers now uh, on Twitter. Now, most of those are following our, our real-time information. So you follow the central line, you follow, you follow the Bakerloo line. Now, before the, before the Olympic Games, we probably had a few thousand. So the Games was a huge uh, boost to our, our, our following, if you like. And this is going up uh, all the time. 190,000 fans uh, on Facebook. We don't particularly have a target for that. Uh, and we use Facebook and we use YouTube, particularly as sort of customer service support, if you like. So how to use your Oyster card, you know, how to uh, you know, find out where the Docklands Light -like Railway runs and th th those sorts of things. But these can be, you know, that sort of numbers can be seen very much as permission to interact uh, and engage with the customer. So how we manage it, bit of the sort of the train spot a bit. Um, it's flexibly delivered across TFL. Now, Oyster is primarily done via customer contact centre. And again, Fran alluded to this, that what we actually have a, a sort of a virtual approach to, uh, to social media. So different people who have responsibility for different pieces of service operation deliver their information. So our streets team sit and take in the information about how the roads in London are doing, and they tweet out what the... What, 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 what's happening, as do the people on the tube lines. My team will oversee an overall strategy for this, but it's a sort of a, it's, it's quite an interesting virtual, virtual approach. It's 24-7. This is the Oyster team, has a team of 10, and they work in, in shifts. We, we don't outsource anything to anybody. So the people who are talking are the authentic voice of the transport, the transport system. And we found that that's been quite an, quite an important thing. We've got some good feedback. Uh, around that. The queries e each day is on the increase. This again is on Oyster, I've probably had about 45, now it's 200. It'll just keep going up. And, and we know that our numbers 
just keep going. Our customer service numbers, just like our website numbers, just keep going up all, all, all the time. Because people are, you know, are hungry for information about, uh, 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 about transport. Response time is about two to three minutes, and we use an executive version of Hootsuite to manage the total uh, social media operation. Because obviously it's dispersed in a number of centers. It allows us to lay off uh, how the call handlers work, manage it, productivity, uh, 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 all, those, uh, all those sorts of things. We measure, we measure the different channels. So Twitter, we do an online survey to followers. The phone, we have mystery shopping. And email and letters, we have mystery shopping. Again, this is because of we, we operate a huge contact center, not just for, for the Oyster card, but for, you know, if you think about it, congestion charge, all the other services, all the tube lines that we, um, uh, that we operate. We look at time, we look at cost, we look at satisfaction, and we also look at impact on reputation. And increasingly, we are particularly concerned about what the TFL reputation is, not because we want, you know, of itself that's important, but we know that if TFL is seen to be doing a good job for London, that helps our overall funding case. Transport is heavily subsidised. If we can be seen to be doing a good job, it helps us in, the, in, our, in our case for funding uh, for the new products and services that we, that we, that you uh, that, uh, need to introduce. So that's, a, that's an important uh, secondary element for us. So what's our research saying? So it's 74% satisfaction with the real-time information feed. So that's the tube. There's a, there's a, there's a, a, a feed for bus and also our traffic uh, results as well. And that's actually quite a strong result given that actually, again, it's particularly our unique way in which we're using it, we're often passing on bad news. We're often, <laughs> we're often saying uh, it's, it's running a bit slow or it's not working or the, the traffic's backed up on the... On the uh, uh, Blackwall Tunnel, but people actually value that real-time, just-in-time information. We've only just started measuring the, uh, the Oyster um, uh, feed, and that was 71% satisfaction of that in September 2013. The Oyster is slightly different, so whereas the real-time information is, is giving service status, the, the, the Oyster is picking up, it's, it's sort of brailing the social media uh, space and saying, okay, these are the queries that are coming up. Uh, uh, around Oyster, because our, our, our operators look out to see what people are talking about and we'll, we'll intervene and say, look, you can do this, you can do that, you've got a query on your card, uh, do that, as well as dealing with direct uh, uh, input uh, com coming into us. So that satisfaction level is sort of similar to our real-time uh, feeds. And we also measure what the impact is on our reputation, because I've talked about how important that is, and it is largely positive and in line with the pattern for, for satisfaction scores. And again, you can imagine an organisation like TFL being sort of quite nervous about social media and going into it, you know, the control, because it's you know, suddenly, you know, you're being talked about um, and, and, and discussed in sort of some quite sort of public, public ways and passed around. And, and what, what might that do? Uh, we, have a, we have a politically elected mayor. Uh, and he likes to know and see you know, what people are talking and, and, and saying about things. So that, that sort of control and how our perception is managed is, um, is quite important to us. Here's some examples of, um, of satisfied customers. I don't know what you can see, but we get some quite nice uh, little dialogues. Where can I buy a monthly pass and have my, um, my 18 plus discount included? Any tube station ticket will apply the discount. So there's some quite practical uh, queries that are coming, coming in and uh, that... that that we're dealing with. Um, how much is it on the train with a 16 plus oyster? And we get these little feeds. You know, and that's you know, the old 140 characters, quick and back and forward, done, solved, move on. Um, and we've got lots of those um, uh, all the time. Here's quite a nice example of, um, of, of a couple of things here. So we, we tweeted out the Jay-Z concert taking place at the O2 Arena. You got 99 problems, make sure traffic ain't one. Now, I'm told <laughs> that that relates to that sort of <laughs> popular musician and who, has a, who has a combo of some sort and they perform. Um, and that was sort of relevant. Um, and that actually tipped off. Did, that did two things quite well. It put across quite a nice sort of, you know, image of, 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 of TFL and being sensitive and engaging, but it also gave some quite practical information and it was retweeted quite a bit, it was favourites and responses. And again, we've had to sort of 
rock and roll with, with, with how we've used social media and allow our operators a little bit more freedom about you know, what might not be seen as normally traditional public sector language about how you might, how you might go out. And again, you know, where we might have been sort of you know, controlling with a press office around you know, uh, what, what, we're, what we're putting out, we're giving quite a lot of responsibility to these, these operational people to, to put out things about TfL and our services. Um, and again, that's been quite interesting in terms of the, sort of the internal dynamics uh, uh, around that. Uh, boring but important chart that shows that we manage all this and measure all this stuff to hell and back. Because again, public body, very accountable. And we're doing a lot of work to say, OK, what's the channel? What's the contacts? What's the time to service? What's the cost? You know, look at the ratios of servicing. What's the customer satisfaction score? And we're just rolling this stuff all the time uh, and, 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 and looking at it. How should we be managing and working with uh, our, our customers going forward? What form should our customer service uh, take going forward? The importance of phone. Um, I haven't mentioned CRM, for example. We have a, a huge, huge database, three and a half million something uh, Oyster card users, which we're mailing and linking with. And that, and that connection between our, our, our CRM base and our social base, again, is, 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 is quite important. Um, and again, we touched on this combination of the social with the advertising. We have a long-running Oyster campaign which we're currently doing like what we call our oyster education. So we're going back, you may have seen it, we're telling people about oyster capping, about how we're auto-completing journeys and stuff like that. And again, we're now saying to people, your oyster questions are answered at TFL. We run that, and again, we've seen the, um, the, the questions coming into that, um, that, that, that call centre for, for oyster dramatically improving. So that's just a quick train spotter's canter through uh, what we're doing, and I'm sure there'll be questions and so forth later. So, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so, because we've got limited time, I'm going to try and shoot through this for you. Um, but just give you a bit of the context from the point of view of O2 and how uh, we're measuring social media currently. Um, so, I thought I'd start with, you know, a quote or a bit of a stat. I find these quite astonishing, um, particularly in the context of O2 in that you know, there are still some businesses that, you know, this quote, you know, references two-thirds that have a dedicated social media resource, yet only 10% of them are reporting the benefits um, back into the business. Now, I don't know how true that is. Probably, you know, it's along those kind of lines. But in the context of O2, where we have, you know, over 30 people touching social media each day, you know, it just, it's, it just wouldn't happen. Um, we'd all lose our jobs quite, quite fast. So... I mean, why is that happening when we're looking at these kind of trends? So we know people are increasingly looking to social media for recommendation, uh, for referrals from friends, and we know those kind of trends are, in, are on the upward. So we kind of need to respond and need to understand that a lot more. And in order to do that, I think we firstly have to kind of take a step back and look at the role of social media within the organisation. So looking at O2 as an example, um, our three kind of key areas are one, to support our commercial objectives in terms of our campaigns, initiatives, uh, customer engagement and insights for our intelligent teams, um, to manage our reputation and influence how we're kind of perceived externally, and third, a kind of big part of it that's, you know, growing um, continuously is um, how we service our customers in this digital world. Now, a lot of this is carried out centrally at O2 through one team, although a key point here is that all our insights come from our business intelligence team. So there is that single view of insights throughout the organisation. The wealth of information they have um, from other areas of the business and from social and bringing it across to tell this one story. So in terms of social media measurement, you know, what are we looking at? So we focus on three key areas here, so campaign metric, channel and business. Now, as you kind of move along the kind of customer journey, it becomes a lot more difficult. These, these kind of first couple of areas here, exposure and engagement along the journey, are quite easy to measure, but you know, what do they really mean? When we start moving along a lot more, we start to get into a lot more interesting types of metrics that align a lot closer to, to the business's actual objectives, so things like message association, um, customer satisfaction, um, changes in sentiment and brand association. 
and a really important one when we're talking about service around cost savings. So we at O2 know um, the cost of diversing from someone from traditional voice and social and into social, uh, we can actually put a pound value on that. So we can actually measure the amount saved by servicing someone online rather than via traditional call. So then what does all, all of this kind of mean when we look at um, a big campaign like this? Um, Beyonce earlier this year, you know, over 50,000 mentions of Beyonce and O2 on social media. Um, but what does that actually mean to our brand? So I know our business intelligence team and so, some of the social guys thought about this a lot. You know, what can we actually do with this? What, how, what does it actually mean, us doing all this kind of activity and social around this campaign? How can we report this back to the business? So as a business, we are our number one KPI is customer experience, uh, which a lot of this is about. So that's what we need to report back on. So then we started thinking, how can we then include social media in our customer satisfaction surveys and our brand trackers? And this is where we got to. So we started adding in questions, do people interact with our social media channels? Um, you know, adding these questions into our surveys. Um, and these are the kind of results that we got. And they're quite, they're quite um, outstanding, really. Um, when we look across all our channels, or even holistically, you know, to use O2 in the future, the attractiveness of the brand, um, and all these other metrics, they all index higher when someone is inter interacting with us on these channels. And even more profound, when we start looking at our actual customer satisfaction, when someone has interacted with us on social media, it's higher across all these different metrics. But context is actually everything. So we know people that upgrade a lot, you know, they index a lot higher. We're talking about customer service, a huge function of our social media team. Their satisfaction is a lot higher as well because they're finding that our service through social media, particularly Twitter, Facebook, is a lot more efficient maybe than our other channels. And not only does it help us inform that, it also helps inform our actual content and campaigns. So this kind of information, not just for reporting back to the business, but reporting back on our future um, initiatives is very important. Now I'd like to take you through a kind of a recent um, example of where we kind of tried to take this to the next level. Um, our most recent brand campaign um, around Be More Dog, a lot of you have probably seen it. Um, so it was all about trying to change people's, um, people's attitudes towards technology and towards the world. So to become more positive and start embracing the kind of world around us, be more active, be more sociable, um, and all these kind of different um, attributes that a, a dog does have. So this transcended into social with a lot of different kind of creative tactics, um, different pieces of content, and um, little... Um, tactical campaigns here around kind of partnerships of BuzzFeed, Vlogger Outreach, and um, you know, innovative little ideas around here using Vime. What we did uh, with the help of Twitter um, and commissioned, commissioned by Twitter with the help of uh, Nielsen was we tried to measure the effect of this campaign in social media on some actual brand um, objectives. So these are the metrics we looked at. Um, so association does do the people that were engaged with this content, do they associate O2 with cool new experiences? Which is, which is um, this was a really kind of key message that we were trying to get across. Intent, um, is there any likelihood of them joining O2 in the future? Favorability, and um, do they see O2 as innovative and forward thinking? Now the results were interesting. Now this is quite interesting for the social marketers in the room in that anyone that the, the content resonated a lot more with the kind of followers of O2. Um, quite an obvious point, but um, a good one to kind of really note and a good one to sell back into the business when you're trying to get more money and more kind of investment into the um, discipline as well. When we look across, across these four kind of metrics, we notice a directional lift um, as um, across all the metrics, the more exposures they received um, to any types of the content. And again, we were also enabled to look at the kind of effectiveness of the actual content in itself. So we can see here, particular pieces of content performed a lot better than others across the different metrics. 
um, quite embarrassingly, um, this one Dom Jolly piece across all the metrics um, was negative, which proves we should never use him again in any of our kind of advertising. <laughs> <laughs> so in summary, um, we measure social media across these three different levels, campaign, channel, and across business objectives. Um, we ensure that we investigate the impact of social KPIs beyond just the campaign, um, and we don't limit ourselves just to the numbers. This is quite key in that we have social media sitting within our business intelligence team. So we're very careful because it gives us, obviously, as the marketers pushing the content out, we can't be biased. And obviously they can relate this information a lot back to the other um, data they have around the business. And then social becomes ubiqu um, ubiquitous. You know, it all just comes together there and that we want to come out and tell this business this one message we've already referred to a lot earlier about social needs to be integrated into the marketing mix and this is kind of true when we talk about it here as well. Thank you. Right, afternoon. Am I the last? Right, I am from BT. Hello, I'm Joanna. Um, I'm going to talk about how social works for BT. I am unashamedly not going to focus on the marketing and advertising and return on sales um, aspect. Um, I come from the customer service side of the business and that's where I'm going to focus just now. So um, I thought I'd start with this, which is some Adobe research from last year, um, which asked, um, in fact, it asked marketeers, so a slight bias there, what a business is usually using social for. As you can see, customer service was last on the list. About one in four businesses actually felt that customer service was a priority for social. Um, and that kind of made me think, well, if you ask customers what they're doing in social media and what they want out of social, uh, what would their hierarchy look like? Would it look like this? I don't think it would. Um, in fact, I think that as far as customers are concerned, very often um, social media presents a new channel to vent a lot of frustration. And one of the first things that they're coming for is uh, the opportunity to amplify a complaint, make a lot of noise, uh, throw a few toys out of the pram and basically expect a better service as a result. So um, that's very much the angle that we've come at social from, almost the reverse from many businesses, I think, which have often started with a kind of marketing, broadcast, communications, channel kind of approach to social, and then latterly discovered that actually what happens is you get a wave of service requests come back, and then you've suddenly got to figure out how to operationalize managing those service requests. Um, otherwise, your whole marketing feed is polluted by all of that negative sentiment. So we did it the other way around. We basically started with service, and we've perhaps been a little slower off the blocks with our marketing, but it's very much based on uh, an operational management of service queries over social, and that's the angle we have. So um, we have clear objectives, uh, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but the, the four uh, principles are our reason to be in social media for BT is one, to improve service, two, to build loyalty and advocacy, three, to create warmth around the brand, and fourth, um, and last, in fact, to acquire customers. And it, re it really is in, in that order. So some of the things that we focus on um, as measurements for those objectives are here. It's not all of them. Um, as far as service goes, our measure of the quality of service is how easy it is to get your thing done, your resolution, your answer, whatever it is. Um, so we principally measure our service channels on how easy they are, um, through the voice of the customer, obviously. Uh, we also look at cost avoidance, um, as some of the other speakers have mentioned. Um, and a key lever for that is the health of the community, the peer-to-peer -peer community that is part of that service infrastructure. So um, community health is a strong one. As far as loyalty and advocacy goes, uh, clearly we want to look at propensity to churn for customers who have... Um, engage with us over social media. You can count followers and fans, but more interesting is how those followers and fans engage with your content and amplify it and retweet it or respond or enter competitions or whatever that is to, to, to um, show the effectiveness of what you're doing. Um, as far as brand warmth goes, uh, positive mentions, always nice. We get an awful lot of the opposite, um, but a positive mention is nice. And how far that positive mention goes, its reach, is, a, is an important thing to look at. 
Um, and obviously, um, you know, lots of brands, us included, are using social listening to gauge sentiment and swings in sentiment and the reasons why things, why sentiment swings. So all that big data stuff on social listening is really important to kind of gauge, are you, are you moving in the right direction, really? And um, finally, uh, acquiring customers, obviously the reach of, of the messaging that you're using uh, and conversion rates would be the obvious ways to track that. So I'm not going to go through every measure, but I'm just going to share with you a few examples of how those measures apply to our case. And that there's a nice surprise slide in here that Fran shoved in that I haven't put in, so see if you can tell when I get to it, okay? <laughs> um, so, uh, as I said, the first priority is making it easy to get your service. Um, and this is our patent easyometer. Um, uh, it really is our measure of, of service channels. And the channel makes a massive difference to how easy things are, so I shall show you the difference. Here, if you want to write a letter to BT... Um, sorry, the easyometer is uh, there's a concept called net easy, which basically, like net promoter score, you take the customers who say it was easy, customers who say it was difficult, take the difficult off the easy, net easy. That's what we're showing here. Um, letters. Minus 20 on the net easy scale. Not surprising. Not, couldn't really argue that it's easy to pick up a pen and actually write to us. Um, then you've got this cluster in the sort of just about positive sometimes of email, voice, automated voice, uh, online self-service, all between sort of 0 and 20 on your net easy scale typically. But then over here, you've got social and chat. So the feedback that we get from customers on how easy it was to get their resolution We've got uh, between sort of plus 40 and plus 60 on our net easy scale is where social and e-chat come. So it's clearly where our customers would like us to be offering service and our strategy is therefore to move there and provide service where they want us to be. Um, ah, I'm going to pretend I've, se <laughs> pretend I've seen this. There's a slight, <laughs> slight difference in kind of look and feel. Right, um, this is actually my chart. Um, it's a very important one. I don't disagree with Fran that it should have been in the deck. Um, the reason it's so important to make it easy for customers to get service is there's a direct correlation with churn, which we could prove through our data. So here you have proof. I've, I know what's on this chart. This is the line. The top line is customers who've had an interaction with us. They found it easy. And over six months, that's the behavior in terms of churn. So that's our decay curve for customers who found it easy. And this red one at the bottom is our decay curve over six months for customers who found it difficult. And you can see there's a very, very clear differential between the two, which amounts to around about 2% of all customers churning over a six-month period. There's a difference between providing an easy experience and a difficult one. So our return on investment in social media service is directly predicated on that evidence. Um, uh, an, another angle on it um, in terms of brand warmth and, and reach, publicity that you can't really buy um, and you know my fellow speakers have uh, similar experiences and similar uh, good stories to tell but you know just five people saying thank you on Twitter in a period of two or three days um, reach, reach 3,900 people through, through their influence and that's something I can't generate in any other way other than just by providing the service and waiting for people to respond in a positive way. So um, that kind of reach is, is like gold dust, really. Um, the third angle is really transparency. And when you're in a service environment, transparency equals understanding, if you like. It makes life just slightly easier if you give the transparency of what's going on under the bonnet, if you like, and um, Christian would have many such examples, and I'm sure Chris would as well. Um, so when you have a fire in an exchange building, for example, this was in <laughs> Gerrard Street, where it took out the broadband service to the West End, or a flood in Paddington Exchange, or a vandalised cabinet in Woolwich, which all burnt out. If you tweet a picture that explains to people what's going on, the response you get is massively more positive and more understanding than um, if you just said, I'm really, really sorry, we'll work to put it back, it, uh, you know, expected re service restoration time is whatever. Um, you, instead, you get stuff saying, wow, now that's transparent, you know, and people start retweeting to each other because, um, you know, they want to spread the understanding, if you like. It's really positive for us. Um, and the other positive for us is your followers go up. 
So your actual channel with which you can communicate, when you're providing useful information like that, that people can see the value of, this, it, we had a 65% jump in our, in our um, Twitter followers on one of these days when we tweeted one of these pictures. Um, and those people, as you can see, stay attached um, and become part of your, of your community thereafter. Um, so that's one kind of crisis. Um, another kind of crisis of an altogether different uh, scale, um, the London riots. Um, hands up, who knew that BT answers the phone when you ring 999? Be honest. No, well, not many. Okay. So, um, on the night of the London riots, the biggest night of the London riots, uh, we faced a 41, min 41 second wait time on 999 because of all the calls we were getting in. Um, so, we tweeted out this message that said, please call an absolute emergency only, London riots. Um, that tweet reached 312,000 people, thanks to a lot of retweets. <laughs> Um, and our wait time on 999 went down again from 41 seconds to zero, where it should be and where it usually is. Um, so we don't often get genuine life and death situations in my line of work, but this was one, and it shows the value and the power of social media in, for crisis management and service. And I think... Oh, yes, cost reduction. Of course I need to talk about cost reduction. <laughs> so um, as far as service goes... You kind of got to work out where the value comes from and whether this is cheaper or more expensive than doing it some other way. So the way we use, we work it out, we, we work out how many unique customers we've dealt with and we have a, a factor which we apply for our sort of resolution success rate, if you like. Sometimes that's got some assumptions in it, mostly it's based on empirical evidence. Um, and then we look at the handling cost of dealing with that volume of queries in another channel and that gives you your cost avoided you can then uh, net off your cost of doing that in the social media channel instead, which is usually much cheaper because a lot of it is zero touch, and then you get to a net cost saving. And if we add up the net cost savings from our community forum, from Twitter service, from Facebook and from YouTube videos, it amounts to about two million a year um, of cost saving, which uh, that there is our... Um, service contact centre in Exeter, which contains 145 um, agents and a number of managers and supporters, and that's roughly what that costs. So a whole contact centre, basically, um, is saved by uh, being in social media and providing service more efficiently in a zero touch. So I think that's the end. I was just going to cover our objectives and our measures and say thank you very much. So, just before we go on to, the, um, uh, to Stephen and to the final panel session, I think it's, it's worth just, um, just reminding ourselves that, you know, a lot of those cases had some real ROI metrics in them. You know, tourism, the, the number of tourists in Iceland was measured by footfall. The amount of sales that carry food generated through their social media was measured through the mixed ma market modelling. Um, the, the, the genius of NetEasy for BT creates a £2 million pound, uh, cost saving. The sort of speed and, and uh, customer satisfaction that, that uh, Transport for London are doing, obviously that increases customer satisfaction as well. And O2, clearly they are measured on customer satisfaction throughout the organisation and social is being measured on how that delivers that. So, you know, this, this stuff is, you know, is hard, but it's not impossible. So then thinking really about all of these studies and the seven points that we made earlier, I'd really like to just leave you with two thoughts. One being that in the marketing communications area of those sort of three areas we talked about, it, it, we do need the same rigour and techniques, and, may, and maybe expanding on the techniques, that are applied in traditional and other marketing communications. And on the customer services side, um, you know, it, it seems that certainly from the conversations and from the uh, case studies that we looked at, one of the areas that might be useful is this, this, this is creation of a metric of metrics uh, that on, is actually known to relate to the business success of that organisation. And finding that and being able to compare the various channels with social is an extremely important uh, metric to, to try and develop. 
So I'm now going to hand you back to Stephen, who's just going to take you on to, the, um, to our next stage of this whole project before we go on to the panel session. Thanks very much. Thank you, Fran. That's great. Um, so we're going to go through the panel now and um, ask them, you know, I really want to open this to the floor and get some, some questions of, of the presenters here. Just so you know what we're doing next, I mean, having gone through that process, if I go back to my original chart, we're looking at adding to this treasure house of learning, so that's a whole series of different cases. We're looking at these robust methodologies, and we've got a couple that are beginning to emerge there, and we're looking at the whole area of a detailed guide. What we're doing on the right-hand side here is the MRS, who, who are involved with this very, very closely, are very kindly going to help us develop a detailed guide in this particular territory so that we can look at the, the how-to, what the techniques are, what the actual research techniques that we can use. Secondly, what we're going to do, um, we've talked about a couple of methodologies that we think are emerging here, which are very strong. We clearly need to develop more of those. We clearly need to make sure that they are robust enough by looking at all the cases that we develop over a period of time. And thirdly, which is really important, is we really want as much support, and we'd ask anybody here today or anybody who knows anybody who has potentially got some good cases, whether it's to do with customer service, to do with customer insight or communications, that would be interested in us talking to you about the potential for that being a case that we can go into our bank, that we can evaluate and look at. And there's all sorts of ways of doing this. We've got a LinkedIn group. You can tweet or the Facebook um, page as well for the IPA. So all sorts of ways of getting involved. So we really would encourage everyone to, to add any thoughts they've got, any cases they're working on, any agencies are in the room who are working on a particular brand that they would like to, to explore further. The way we approach this is very much, you know, if somebody's got an idea or they've got a particular case that they're working on, they're not certain, certain if it's robust enough, let's just have the conversation because we want to develop that thinking and that bank of data. Let's go over to the panel now. If I could ask everyone to, to come up on stage, including Mark um, and Paddy and the speakers. Um, and um, let's um, go into a little bit more detail. Um, I mean, one, one of the... Um, I mean, if I can, ju if I can just start with, with, a, with a question, um, if I go to Paddy and, and Mark in particular, actually. Um, I mean... I think one of the things that seems to be quite clear out of this is that there's a bit of ambiguity generally. So while we started this process very much thinking that, you know, it's social media in a communication sense, what's become apparent throughout this process is that there are lots of other areas, obviously, that social media impacts on, and it's all very complex. There's a lot of customer service work here that we've been talking about where we can prove the ROI in customer service. Almost... It's almost become a little bit easier to do that than it has in communications, interestingly. Whereas when we started, we were thinking much more about marketing communications. Yeah. I would just be interested, you know, Paddy, maybe in your view about that, about why you think that's the case, um, or maybe you don't think it's the case. Um, we're, we're, uh, we will see more examples of, of the use in communications, um, but uh, it's been somewhat overhyped as, you know, in terms of this changes everything, throw away the television, all that sort of all that sort of stuff. Uh, whereas in the case of Insight, um, it seems to me uh, pretty well all brands should be using social media as a source of insight, mainly the big data that's been talked about. To some extent, your own proprietary online brand community as well. It's sort of uh, like having a group of customers next door. Mm. You get very, very fast responses to ideas and suggestions and concepts. Mm. As far as customer service is concerned, one reason it's much harder, easier to prove is because there are cost savings. Um, the other is, is uh, I mean, Joanna's wonderful surprise chart. Um, uh, one of the things which struck me about that uh, was that the lines were asymmetric. Mm. And that's a key, key point, which is something uh, a lot of marketers are very uncomfortable with. Um, because we get excited about, I mean, again, Fran talked about, don't just focus on fans. You know, in general, the evidence is that the penetration <coughs> strategies work better than the loyalty strategies, in line with what Ehrenberg said in the late Stone Age. This is, not, this is nothing sort of completely, uh, completely new. Similarly, marketers um, are not very interested in general, not naturally interested in the drives of, drivers of customer satisfaction. What marketers really love is the drivers of customer delight, okay? And that's wonderful, but uh, if you take 
if you actually do what Peter Drucker said in 1954 and see the world through the customer's eyes, actually the things which matter most are the sources of customer dissatisfaction. Mm. And, uh, you know, we shouldn't just leave that to the operations people. What I loved about that chart was not just that you got a very demonstrable effect on churn, mm. but also the churn curve for the neutrals was pretty close to the churn curve mm. for the positives. Mm. It's a three-to-one Three to one ratio. Uh, okay. Eliminating the, the difficulty it, to promoting okay. the actual ease. And that's why net promoter score, or your mm. version of mm. net promoter score, that's why, you know, focusing on the minority of detractors is really, really important. Mm. And I think social media have a huge role in, in keeping in touch with those people. So mm. that's all I'll say at this yeah, point. Very good. Thank you. Mark? Great. I mean, I'm just going to cut a couple of things to add to that because I completely agree with what Paddy's, Paddy's saying there. The first thing is we're moving from a world which the IPA effectiveness activities have documented really well. And we kind of, kind of, it's a game that we got lots and lots of really good learning about how that stuff works and how to measure it mm. and how to turn that into business value, justify it. This is not the same thing. Mm. This is not a simple set of technologies that's just about entertainment or whatever mm. that we mm. piggyback. This is a whole bunch of stuff. Mm. Secondly, this is a bunch of stuff that's changing rapidly. So our learning about it is going to have to be equally dynamic. Mm. Uh, and I think that means that if you'd have hoped for us as a group of people to come and go, okay, so this is the answer, this is the equivalent body of learning that we've developed about television and print and posters, mm. uh, I, you're not going to get it, mm. right? So I think that's, that shapes mm. the, what this group's doing and why these, these mm. very different approaches are, coming, uh, are being presented now. I think the third thing is that we've all longed in the advertising and marketing land to have a broader impact on the organization. Mm. It's only in the last 10 years, really, that effectiveness cases have been won when they say, and this amplifies the other stuff that's going on, and this starts mm. inside <clears throat> the organization, then moves out. And this, I think, takes it on to another level, this kind of technology. This is the great examples from, from Chris and, and, and Joanna and, and uh, and also, sorry, yes, Christian as well, show this is not just about marketing acquisition. This mm. is not just about the marketing department as buying yeah. communication stuff mm. and us just doing stuff that they want to buy. Mm. This is about us genuinely being a bit able to help businesses change mm. how they operate. Yeah. And not in some sort of clue train manifesto hippie-ish way, but <laughs> fundamentally thinking our job is to help businesses improve their performance. Mm. Generally. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in fact, one of the things that you touched on, Chris, is the whole area of, of almost it binding the business together a little bit more uh, social, you know, almost creating that glue in the organisation. Would you say that? I mean, that's maybe an issue yeah. also you've come across in O2 and BT as well. Would you say that's kind of how it works? Yeah. Sorry. You should be. You got a Am I, uh, yeah, you're on. Can you hear me at the back? <laughs> you can, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I think, uh, I, I think you're right. I mean, we're a federated business. A federated business. You sort of have a sense of Transport for London is some sort of beautifully integrated thing, but actually it's made up of a, a whole range of, uh, of, of completely, uh, arguably completely separate services. Of, you know, mm. slightly different cultures, slightly different stuff. You know, so the people that, that manage the roads are dealing not they're dealing with users rather than direct customers because you don't they're not. If you're using the roads, you're not necessarily actually sort of bought anything. Whereas obviously, if you're, if you're using a bus or a tube, you've, you're a customer and you paid some money and, uh, and, and and stuff like that. So trying to get that integrated culture across a business, which says actually, people, you know, when people contact us, they don't say, "Oh, I can't handle that query because I only do roads," or "I can't <laughs> I can't handle that query. I'm I'm on the oyster desk. You know, have to call. Mm. You have to contact someone someone else if it's about congestion charge." So trying to get that sort of seamless sense of you know, one customer, one mm. view of the customer, in integrating what we uh, what mm. we do has been has mm. been quite powerful. But mm. actually, doing that also in a in a virtual way, you don't actually necessarily need to sit in one big one big call center or, uh, mm. or, or 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 something like that. And the other thing it's done, I touched on it, is actually put some put some a lot of staff who aren't necessarily running hard services directly in front of customers. So, you, you know, they're sort of dealing with customers. Right. So that, yeah, that, yeah. that linkage between mm. the customer and, the, and, and us is, is, is really, really mm. shortened. It's quite interesting. Very good. 
Um, any questions <coughs> from me? Yes. For the marketing communications examples that you used, they were both what could be called traditional advertising campaigns. So they had a start and an end, and they were seeking to achieve a specific thing. Did you see any examples where ongoing communication from a brand throughout social was put forward as an interesting case, and they just weren't good enough, that's why they weren't included, or were they just not considered as part of this? Because for no, me, I think that's the really interesting use of social by a brand when they're constantly yeah. saying hi, not with the customer service environment, but with a, a content. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think Frank will answer that. I mean, we certainly looked at lots of cases that yeah. do exactly that. But we've hit upon these. Do you want to explain yeah, why? Yeah, well, we, we, we hit upon a number of, um, of areas where the, either the, um, the cause and correlation issue kept coming up, um, um, and also that the you know maybe there was just one piece of creative that just kept being repeated, mm -hmm. and um, and so they just they just weren't uh, of the of the standards so far it's to be able fair to, to do. Say it. That, you know we have been extremely ruthless in this because I think that you know it's very much it's not just about likes, it's not about retweets, it's not about brand <coughs> engagement. It's ultimately got to have a business ROI benefit, and so mm -hmm. you know we have really been as ruthless as we possibly can to arrive at examples where we really, really can prove that. So, but of course, I think the other issue is over a period of time, it's going to be a lot easier, of course, because you know, we, can look at, we can look at TV over 40 years or 50 years, and there's obviously that, collect, that, there's that, that, that sort of uh, cumulative effect, whereas it's obviously more difficult in social. But I suspect we're being, we've all put our hair shirts on quite a lot here you know, to make sure that we really have got the, the ruthlessness of the rigour and, and uh, the data. I mean, can I say that the, yeah, Paddy, what, yeah. what is not that helpful are sort of cases which are kind of positive but not very convincing. Yes. Mm. What would be really helpful would be some cases of failure, mm. which, you know, in life one learns much more from failure than from success. Mm. And if we mm. could get some cases yes. of failure, which yes. of course can be deeply, deeply disguised. I mean, the ideal case actually talking to companies is when there's a failure followed by a success. Yeah. Mm. And then you, then you have a sort of narrative and people, you know, it's like a rom-com, you know, as, as earlier presentation said, you know, you don't know how, but you do know at the end of the last reel. And um, so do come and talk to us, you know, you don't have to wear a false beard about your failures because failures are really important at this still rather early stage of the development of, of the use of social media in I think, marketing. I think Absolutely on the, right. yeah. and the other thing I think was that in some of the cases, the, um, the continual strategies, mm -hmm. again, we're only looking at the fans mm -hmm. and not looking at a comparison with non-fans or you know, developing that whole cohort analysis, which is really, really needed to prove that what you are doing in your social strategy is actually having a business effect mm -hmm. on the long term. Other questions? Conversation. Mm -hmm. And if there's no evidence that it works, mm -hmm. that's quite bad. So I think yeah. there's a massive onus on the industry. Mm. We're very good at proving the effectiveness of one-off campaigns. Mm. Yes. We need to get much better at proving that investing in mm. Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn strategies for three years is mm. effective. Otherwise, absolutely. And I think there's doing. potentially a you know the, um, instead of doing the, the sort of the campaign award or the award for a social campaign there may well be an award for a social strategy over long term. Yeah. Mm. I mean, in the same, in the, the, marketing, the marketing society has a, a long-term effect mm. award, and this is the sort of area that that would fit into, actually, yeah. quite well. Christian, would you like to add something? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I would tend to agree in that it's, it's, it is very difficult as well to measure the impact of a campaign. Particularly in social media, they are so short term. We're talking yeah. two to three weeks. Um, even the kind of data I showed about um, our Be More Dog campaign there, we noticed that as the the impressions or kind of engagements of the campaign increase, the higher the intent was, um, which kind of tells us we should be always on. Yeah. Um, we shouldn't be doing these tactical pieces. It happens in a lot of organisations. A lot of social media campaigns are fueled by marketing budgets. Um, there aren't budgets for social media on its own. Therefore, they're very tactical. They're on and off. Um, there is a great argument and onus on the industry to be always on and yeah. think about that longer, longer term strategy. Mm. Yeah. Joanna, just a question for you. How arriving at your, your easyometer, your, I mean, how difficult was it in the business? to do that, to get an agreement around that metric, because it's quite a fantastic way of evaluating that everyone's obviously signed up to. Well, 
not at all difficult if you do the analysis that links it with loyalty and churn, <laughs> right. to be honest. So if you've got good data and you can mm. prove it, and I can prove it at <coughs> both a direct and an indirect level, so I can prove um, after an interaction that was difficult, I can prove a 1.5% th um, increment in 30-day mm. churn. Regard without correcting for contract end dates and so on, and then I can, and I can pr show the longer term kind of decay effect. So with that, armed right. with that data, the business just sits up and goes, "Wow, okay, yeah. we have to make it easy. W what's our channel strategy right. yeah. start, to make it, it two easy. million yeah. saving? Mm -hmm. it's yeah. Phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. But Any if I can questions? go, can, can I just go yeah. back to the last question in a moment? And I, I would just say that my, and I'm not a marketeer, so you know, disclaimer, but. Um, my perspective on on that question of the kind of drip drip of the continual presence is what it does very importantly is it creates options for you as a as a marketeer to go to go deeper if something's working. So if you've got so if you've got some sort of general engagement and you, uh, you've got a theme, you're sort of chucking out some content, a couple of things, two or three times a week or whatever it is, and then you find one of them that's driving a lot of engagement, then you've got that option to dive in and go deeper and amplify your presence around that content. And that is valuable in itself. Even uh, And you, without having the continual engagement, you haven't got that. You don't right. know where to go, yes. right? You yeah. don't know where to spend the money. Absolutely um, right. So I think that's quite important. Too. Mm. Any other? Yes. Uh, the examples you've touched on um, seem to stem from the likes of Facebook, Twitter, um, and YouTube in terms of results. Um, what about new and emerging social media networks? Are there any examples from the likes of Instagram or Tumblr? Not that they're necessarily emerging, but that brands are using more and more now to reach certain demographics? Uh, yeah. Frankly, no, not at this stage. Uh, and I think that the, the examples that we've got and the, and the brands and, and th that came forward tend to use those bigger networks. Yeah. Um, and that is, it is potentially an issue. It doesn't mean it won't change, but for the moment, the, the, those networks tended to be the ones that brands focused on and therefore were put into whatever evaluation or metric they, um, they were looking at. But well, we would love, obviously, to have some examples yeah. of that. I mean, this is, as I say, very much a two-way. We're going out there and we're trying to encourage people to give us examples. But if anybody has got examples, we would love to see those because, mm. you know, we want this to represent as much as the marketing and customer service sort of areas and community as possible, really. And I, I also think we, we're very much at the... Uh, we're limited by these networks as well. They yeah. have to mm. offer us the data. Yes. Yes. The tool, we're very held by the tools as well. It's great that Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook are starting to open up now, but when we have these emerging platforms, I believe they have to, you know, look at what the others are doing and kind of follow, follow the path in order for us yes. to, yeah. to look at this. Correctly. Actually, right. and I, yeah, I think that is a data. that is also yeah. another potential issue that we have, you know, going forward. Is you know, traditionally in the market research space, you know, the, the brand owned all the data. Mm. Um, you know, the, the, these networks potentially ha are the gateway yeah. to this knowledge and to this, uh, this information, which is something that we haven't really come up against before as an industry. Well, we're very happy to have Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook yes, very much involved in our, which is why it's so important, because that's why it has to be that collaboration, as yeah. Fran says, because it is all about, you know, getting that data and they, having that access, which is important. Yeah. I think that's particularly true Ready. in terms of insight that... Um, yeah, I mean, Fran, you were so sort of disappointed that yeah. there wasn't, there weren't more sort of insight cases. Mm. But some of us believe there is sort of massive potential, and it may be that what's needed is is you know a specific collaboration with yeah. the platforms, maybe the IPA, the MRS, and maybe the Marketing Society, yeah. um, you know, with an award or something, yeah. just to get some traction. It's a good idea. Yeah. Well, Joanna's told me she's got some insight, so that will be the next presentation. <laughs> I think the question is, 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 what do you mean by it? You know, what yeah. level are you pitching yeah. that, yeah. that, uh, that, that insight? You know, is it, is this, as I was saying, you know, the big mm. earth-shattering, you know, business well, transformational uh, thing? Uh, no, not, not earth-shattering. <coughs> no. you know, I'm always very suspicious of earth-shattering. So <laughs> um, but, um, well, at the very least, sort of the sentiment analysis. Yeah. Okay. Mm. What, what, what people are saying about your brand, your competitors' brands and the category to their, quotes friends unmediated yeah. and not in response to you having asked them a yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah. It seems to me, you know, why would that not be interesting? Yeah. Yeah. It's obviously particularly interesting when there's a crisis. <clears throat> and certainly the, the 
Uh, Fran, will you say the name of the volcano again? <laughs> um, uh, uh, have you got the microphone? Because it's such. This was the best thing so far. I have yet la yokel. That's uh, that one. Yes. Um, <laughs> Have you recorded that? Do you want to... <coughs> now, Sean, Sean, me and I, we had a piece in HBR two or three years ago about, you know, social media, particularly making this point about, you know, people not having, having uh, exploited uh, the potential for insight and so on. And the main case study we used uh, actually was, was Virgin Atlantic, very similar to sort of mm -hmm. TFL. Mm -hmm. And um, they made the point that um, in the case of the website, you have to sort of almost have the lawyers involved. So the website is inherently a more slow-moving thing because if you put something on the website, which then turns out to be wrong, okay, therefore it's not that suitable for uh, situations like Fran's volcano situation. Whereas Twitter, you know, you're going to make some mistakes. You have to delegate to some kids to be able to do it. Then you have to deal with the mistakes. But you need to understand the complementarity that, that people, particularly in a crisis, and actually in the case of TfL, it's not you have. I think TfL is phenomenally well managed, by the way. But uh, you, what you have got is a situation where every minute there is something new in terms of information, and it seems to me social media, uh, you know, are just perfect for that, mm -hmm. and it'll just get more and more important. Well, I mean, it's a I increasingly, we've overlaid the website with yes. this, for exactly that reason. Yes. It's just, you know, just, just people say, stick it on the website. Well, it's just no, too clunky. It's, 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 it's it's the, it has to be the official it needs voice. To flow and, and you need both, yeah, yeah, but they're right. complementary. Yeah.